Dear Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank the European Council on Foreign Relations for organizing this discussion about Belarus after the August presidential election. Uh, last year, Belarusians began protesting against the rigged election results, lawlessness and police violence. And our peaceful movement acquired several important symbols. And today I'd like to mention one of them. Uh, I believe uh, Minister uh, Laudrin has heard about it as well. It is Eve, a simple portrait of a woman painted in France by Haim Soutin, an artist of Belarusian origin. This Eve became the face of our revolution. Belarusians responded to the tyranny with art <coughs> and nonviolence. There were hundreds of thousands of peaceful Belarusians in the streets. The creative female protests, the students singing in the universities, strikes applauding uh, in the factories, Astonishing rallies of the elderly and people with special needs, the parties uh, of the neighbors, and so on. The whole world saw it. However, now the picture is somewhat different. It's harder to find the photos of beautiful mass rallies in Minsk on the covers of the international newspapers, as was the case recently. And there is a question, does it mean that the protests have finished? No, it does not. Belarusians have been peacefully protesting all across the country every, every single day for almost half a year already. The problem is that the only language that Lukashenko's regime seems to know is the language of violence. Belarusians go on protesting every day but they are also kidnapped, beaten, and illegally imprisoned every day. This terror is not a very beautiful picture to look at, but the world must see it. The regime's continuous repression, particularly intensified in November, when the previous Lukashenko's presidential term expired and he was no longer even formally legitimate. In November, the peaceful rallies were turned into a human hunt. And for two Sundays in a row, there were more than 1,000 arrests in a day. The young artist Roman Bandarenko was beaten to death reportedly by the official from Lukashenko's cronies. His family was threatened, and the doctor and journalist who told the truth about him are now in prison. The most politically active neighborhoods of Minsk were taken under 24-hour control by the police. One of them, Nova Baravaya, was left without heating and water for almost three days. There are reasons to consider that this was done intentionally. And we have heard the recording of Nikolai Karpinkov, Deputy Minister of Internal Affairs, who tells his subordinates that Lukashenko lets them shoot the protesters on site and that a concentration camp for the unnecessary Belarusians should be built and the world must know about it. These are the circumstances in which Belarusians live, work, and continue their struggle. To this one should add physical and psychological fatigue, cold winter, and the hard second wave of coronavirus. And despite all that, Belarusians do not give up. They are as brave and creative as they were in summer 2020. Now the uh, protest is decentralized in time and space. Instead of great rallies in the city centers, there are dozens of smaller local rallies and chains of solidarity all over Minsk and other cities. They can happen anywhere at any time of the day and any day of the week. 
they are organized by uh, the communities of neighbors that will certainly become the base for the local self-government in new Belarus. People do not abandon humor and art. Uh, they support each other uh, by writing songs, dancing, building snowmen in national colors, and creating uh, everything with um, white, red, white flags and words uh, live alone Belarus. This is still dangerous. In Belarus, one can be detained for the wrong color of trousers or umbrella. And the world should not forget about it. And another front of this struggle is the quickly developing diaspora. Belarusians abroad support their fellow citizens at home and make sure that Belarus doesn't leave the international media agenda. The diaspora helped to pass the Belarus Democracy Act in the US and to cancel the World Hockey Championship and the Pentathlon Championship in Belarus, which would otherwise legitimize Lukashenko's regime. Now uh, uh, the diaspora uh, try to exclude the Belarusian state TV from the European Broadcasting Union. And I welcome this initiative because Belarusian TV is no longer the place for journalism, but only for propaganda and hate speech. Belarusians are now all over the world and they invite the world to listen to them. And uh, um, now I would like to tell about Igor Losik, a young journalist arrested in false charges on June 25th, 2020. He has been in prison for more than half a year now. To protest, he announced a hunger strike and all of Belarus was worried about him. People asked, uh, people asked him to leave, to be patient, to be sure they will make him free. This Monday, Losik stopped his hunger strike after 42 days. And he said, this is because he was amazed by the incredible wave of solidarity. He saw that Belarusians have changed and this gave him hope. You will not let me down, he writes. Yes, we mustn't let him down. This is what we ask the world and Europe to help us not to let down Igor Losik and other political prisoners who are almost 200 by now. Belarus needs no more sacrifices. Europe needs no more ghettos. The world needs no more concentration camps. Belarusians paid a very high price, some even with their lives, for the dream and the chance to build a new democratic Belarus. We need to hold free and fair elections as soon as possible, making sure that the will of the people is respected. And I truly hope that the EU fourth package of sanctions will be adopted as soon as possible. It's crucial to impose pressure on those responsible for human and civil rights violations, but also target corrupt officials and businessmen. Unfortunately, the reaction of the international community to the political crisis in Belarus is very modest. The adopted sanctions are several times less than after the 2010 elections, when the repressions was dozens of times less. People expect the West to be braver and stronger. There are more opportunities uh, the European Union, United Nations and OSCE need to consider. In particular, in particular, we would appreciate OSCE participating states to lead the mediation process in order to organize inclusive dialogue on peaceful transition in Belarus. Also, we need investigation of crimes against humanity that have already been done and the prevention of the new ones. We ask to establish a high level investigation body and lead the process of evidence collection. 
urgency is essential as state violence and repression continue to increase in Belarus. We also ask two, uh, we also ask two organizations involved, involved in atrocities, Amon and Gubopik, to be recognized as terrorists by foreign governments. And of course, we also need solidarity. The funds originally meant for Lukashenko's oppressive regime need to be redirected to the Belarusian people, civil society, families of the repressed or those participating in national strikes, independent trade unions and independent media. We hope for a united response across the EU institutions on this matter. And uh, it's important to avoid bureaucracy uh, as people need support now. Political, transform uh, political transformation in Belarus can be achieved only with the support of the European Union, the United States and other international partners. The West shall speak with one voice with respect to the political crisis in Belarus. And your principled position on Belarus can help us bring closer the day when Belarusians will finally restore their civil right to elect their leaders in free and fair elections. Thank you so much for your attention. <laughs>